How's it going, everybody? Welcome into the final episode of Debate Night for this season. Can't believe we're already here. The Pro Tour has come to a close with the Pro Tour Championship. And so that means the Debate Night will be done until the Pro Tour comes back. And we have more things to talk about. Until then, we'll be doing the off-season podcast we did it last year hunter will host we do all sorts of fun things in there it's mostly storytelling and we also play some fun games um you can actually submit those hunter is there a way for them to do that yeah i'll have the link in the description you can submit your topics stories random thoughts anything like that and if you want to be a part of the guess the rating slash guess the division game oh yeah email me hunter (laughs) at foundationdiscs.com just send me a picture of you and a link to your pdga profile i've already got like 10 of them so we're already cooking for it i'm just waiting for people people are going to start sandbagging it and like trying to deceive us yeah, feel free sniff, to pose the picture. I don't I'm going to sniff it out. Like, somebody's going to try to look like an am. You can't fool me. You can't. I'm going <laughs> to know. Um, but, yeah, we got that coming up next week. Another thing I want to mention, if you have not checked it out yet, as of yesterday, the first episode of our reality show just dropped on the Foundation Disc Golf main channel. There's going to be a bunch of episodes of that coming out every single Tuesday for a few weeks. So you're going to want to go back and watch that first episode. It is incredible. Um, but... Before we get into the rest of debate night, our final episode, we have a quick word from tonight's sponsor, which is Manscaped. Um, this episode is brought to you by Manscaped, a global leader in men's lifestyle and grooming. Every man knows the unbeatable feeling of a fresh barbershop shave. Now, what if I told you you no longer have to wait weeks or even months between appointments to experience it? Introducing Manscaped's newest innovation, the Chairman Pro Electric Foil Shaver, a game-changing tool that brings the luxury of a professional shave right into your home. Whether you're after that daily silky smooth finish or prefer to maintain a rugged five o'clock shadow, the Chairman Pro Electric Foil Shaver is your go-to for precision and style every time. Head over to manscaped.com and join the over 11 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped by using code Debate Night for 20% off plus free shipping. So what makes the Chairman Pro stand out? Well, it's all about versatility and precision. It comes with two interchangeable skin safe blade heads. You have the skin safe foil, four blade foil for that close smooth shave when you're looking to go completely clean. And if clean shave isn't your style, that's okay. Just switch to the skin safe stubble trimmer that's tongue twister to keep your stubble looking sharp and polished both heads are designed with skin safe technology to help reduce razor burn and irritation so your skin feels smooth and comfortable after every shave reducing redness or discomfort and if you want even more uh, precision, this thing has the Flex Adjust technology. The innovative technology ensures a superior shave by allowing both blades and the pivoting head to seamlessly adapt to unique contours of your face and neck, helping you get great contact with your skin at every angle. So if you want to check this out, you can get the Chairman Pro today and experience a shave as smooth as you deserve. You can get 20% off plus free shipping with the code debate night at manscaped.com. That's 20% off plus free shipping with the code debate night at manscaped.com. Let's introduce our analyst for the final episode of Debate Night for this season, starting with the man of the people, Brody Smith. Yeah, someone took really offense to that nickname on Twitter the other day. Um, I, I, what do you want me to do? All right, it, it is what it is. Oh, man of the people? Yeah, someone got really mad. It's just, it is what it is, brother. Um, That's crazy. Also, Hunter, uh, how awesome is the magic of filming? Because you walking over that hill looks super cool in the new episode. It looked super lame when you were actually doing yeah. it. Um, <laughs> so it's just music, lighting, all those lot. things. It yeah. does It does a whole lot. <laughs> um, but I got to go top comment last week, obviously. Uh, this is from Andrew. He says, I absolutely love debate night, but I cannot stand the clickbait titles. I know it's, ha- oh. it's how it works and everyone does yada, 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 yada. Calling Vinny a choke artist is offensive <laughs> to me. I'm offended. So two things with this, just have to push back a little bit, man, of the people here. One, we sometimes have, I guess you would consider clickbait titles. Absolutely. Here, here I don't think it was a clickbait title. One, I think if it was someone other than Vinny and it said choke artist. I don't think there would be this up in arms, people getting upset. And then you guys actually thought he choked. I think you guys just don't know the definition of choking uh, versus just someone losing. Um, so, you know, it's, I, I think it was all in good spirit. I don't think anyone was actually trying to clickbait. I think you guys literally just don't know what the definition of well, choking is. It turns out he wasn't the only one that took offense to this comment because, or to the title because uh, YouTube <laughs> – 
partially demonetized it due to the title. So that's, that's not the title anymore. But, YouTube didn't like joke artists. Yeah, YouTube I, didn't uh, like that. Oh, that's, Listen, that's why the views on that one wasn't so honest. good. In the, in the past years, Paul Macbeth was kind of my little, like, my, my little uh, minion for titles to make sure I got all those Paul Macbeth fans in. And now it's kind of Calvin Heimberg. So if I've got a chance to call him a choker – and bring all the Calvin fans into the comments. I'm going to do it. I'm, I came up with the title. Don't take this out on anybody else. And um, you have I, have had, no, I guess you have to describe it a different way now. Well, but you described no it as is a B or is a B a bigger choke artist than Calvin? <laughs> yeah. I doesn't call either of them a choke artist. That's that which one is more. Yeah. Wait, what? You can have the two clutchest people in the world. One of them's a bigger choke artist than the other. No, I still don't think you know what choke artist is. There are I'm people saying, out one there that has aren't... to be more than the other. No. They could both not be choke artists. They could just lose. Yeah, correct. But one has to be more than the other. Well, it's okay. We changed it now, so it's all good. Now we just said, like, did AB throw away another major, I think. So people probably like that way more. Um, Gary is also joining us, our most winningest player of the season. Um, going for one more. Uh, you know what? The, the the comment of the week that I saw online was from Alex Dugan. He said, getting sprayed with Victory Barbasol after his win has got to be the closest Ganon Burr has ever come to shaving. I, I was thinking the same thing. I, I was I was about to tweet it out. Like, there's no way, surely, he there's no way he's ever had shaving cream on his face. Well, I don't like, think people really use shaving cream anymore. Not, not as much. Often. Not a lot of guys do like the razor I'm, shaving. I'm Manscaped. No, no. You know what I'm saying? I'm electric razor guy. Yeah. Yeah. Chairman absolutely. Pro, Chairman baby. Pro. Chairman Pro. Chairman Pro. Um, Hunter is also here with us for the last episode. Warm lighting yeah. and all. Yeah, I'm I'm thrilled to be here. Some people are calling Gary the Ganon Burr of this show. And, you know, I kind of like the title. We got the man of the people. We got the Ganon of the people. Now Ryan and I just need nicknames. Gary, you're a big numbers guy. How many wins do you have this year? I know you know. Uh, ten. He knows. Oh, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> Suck it, Ganon. This, uh, is, this is episode 20. Uh, <laughs> 17. This is the 18th uh, competitive episode. And, what does uh, that yeah. mean? Because oh, he did the ones that oh, didn't. Oh. There were no you've been points. been on 20 shows and you've won. So you've been on 18 shows that mattered competitively yeah. and you I, won I, 10 I of them. How many of those have I beat you? 17, 17. finals, um, 10 wins. Hunter, you've beaten I me I think, twice. Hang the banner. Okay. Hang, twice. I hang like the that. banner. I like that. That's crazy. Um, and then, yeah, we got Ryan back joining us tonight. Been oh. a little while, but Ryan <laughs> bringing it in for the finale. Yeah, I, I am going full on underdog. I have, for the previous ones, prepared, prepared, and it was worth nothing. So, you know what? I threw it all out the window, and I'm coming in. I'm pulling a full on. I'm taking Brody's advice, going off the dome. Yeah. Love it. I got one more shot at, at trying to make a final here. There we go. Well, myself. like, my advice is never, like, just go completely oh, off not. the I'm dome. I'm not going completely, but okay. I, okay. Typically I will, like, sit there and try and dig stats and everything, and it just, like, when you go forth – most of the stats have already been eaten up and, and regurgitated by the time true. you get there. Listen, so you just got to argue with the people I'll, that have gone I'll say, before. I'll you. say this. If you're going later, you it's almost always better to, to throw a counter argument and react that's, on your feet. That's, that's yeah. We almost, a lot of times, a lot of times we, I see somebody on the show have a softball toss to them to counter argue. And then they stick mm -hmm. with their point. Cause I think they had planned it. And it's like, mm -hmm. you should have just attacked that. I, I love yeah. it when somebody counter attacks somebody else. That's we you can derail people. You can give someone yeah. something you know they're going to go off the rail before and get them off their their point True. ahead of time. Yeah, I, that, I, that, that's what I was doing. I was I was trying to stick to the script too much, and I'm I'm ready. I'm I love oh. it off the rails, Ryan. Yeah, that almost should be what we should do next season. Is like if you have additional stuff different, say it. But like if you have the same thing, you almost have to like come up with a counter argument. Yeah, that's yeah. I kind of yeah. like that idea. There a lot of hey, we're almost in the there'll be a, there'll be a winter meetings. Uh, the commissioners' meetings will be going on during the winter. Figure out what happens next season because we always like to make changes, improve the show. So I'm sure there'll be some differences. Um, let's get into the uh, the final topics of of the season here. We're going to start talking about Gannon Burr as we've done quite a few times because he keeps winning and keeps dominating. So here's what I want to know because I think this is kind of a fun hypothetical. So obviously Gannon Burr just set an earnings record that is so so far above what we've seen previously and considering the condition of the sport, I think it's fun to ask this question. So how long will it take for Gannon's 200 K earnings record to be broken? Um, hypothetically, will purses have to rise significantly before it's touched again? Brody, what do you think? How long will this record stand? 
Well, I think the first thing is like, I, I think the money thing will kind of go away a little bit. Like it is something that's talked about a whole lot in disc golf. And I think it's because we're dealing with a sport that people weren't really making that much money. And now they're actually making a substantial amount down the road when it's like people making a, let's just say if people was making a million dollars or a million, 200,000, the co- the it's not going to be brought up as much as it is right now. But th- with that being said, um, I'm very curious to see what the purses will do next year, right? Like we saw a drop in the tour championship. Do we see drops across the board? Does it kind of level out? Uh, but as far as like, will it be broken? I'm looking at the money that Gannon left on the table. Um, he won 35 K at the DGPT championship, 30 K at USDGC, 15 at Ledstone and GMC, 13 at Portland open, 12.5 at European open and Deglo, 12 at Waco, 10 at Beaver state fling. The only big money tournaments that he didn't win champions cup, 15 K. He ended up taking 10th there. Only made two, 2000, uh, 30 K world championship. He got seventh, 6,650. And 13K at OTB, he took 13th at 1,230. I mean, the dude was making money at pretty much all the big events. Won the biggest payday with the Disc Golf Pro Tour and the second biggest day. I, I, it's just, to me, it's like it will be broken if purses go up, but I don't think we'll see a, as dominant of a season as this unless Gannon all of a sudden just does something freaky. Okay, so so you're saying purses are gonna have to go up. That's that's the take. Yeah, yeah, it it will get broken if purses go up. If they don't go up, it's gonna be very difficult for anyone to break it. Yeah, fair enough. Um, Okay, Gary, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's important to take a quick second to recognize just how truly great that that the earnings record is there. I know we talk about like inflation and rising payouts, but it's still incredible to see happen. Um, but let's not forget where it started. The tournament that lit Gannon's fire. It was January 5th. The Eagles Wings Unchained Conference Flex Start, $40. <laughs> After that, again, and never looked back this season. So, you know, before this year, I don't think it'd be crazy to see that record broken in like the next five years, but because disc golf was kind of looking strong, but seeing where we're going now, there's a lot more uncertainty there. So, you know, he had seven tour series wins, two major wins, an average finish of 4.2 in all tour events and majors. And he won two of the three biggest payouts, as Bernie said, only missing worlds, which was 30K. I don't really see a lot of purses increasing in any dramatic fashion next year. And I don't see any competitor putting down the same body of work except for Gannon. Um, so I guess to answer your question is, I think this record's only going to stand as long as it takes Gannon to either break it again, which could be next year, but it's, that'd be an incredible season to put down. But for anyone else to beat it, they're going to need the purses to increase. They're, that person's probably going to have to win three out of four majors. The Pro Tour Championship's going to have to be won by them, and then they're going to need to be on the podium all year long to make it happen. So to me, I think that this record is only going to be broken when the sport hits a new growth spurt or when Gannon decides just to be a beast again and put down an even greater season than he did now, which I don't know that he's going to do that back to back. So yeah, uh, I agree with Brody there. Yeah. Hard to picture another season like that happening so soon. Um, Hunter, what's your timeline looking like for this uh, proposition? Yeah. I mean, I got to agree with everything that was just said. My timeline, I'm thinking at least five years, at least, Um, you know, we've been talking about the purses increasing and that's obviously playing a factor. I mean, we don't have to go back that far when I believe it was like Kristen and correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was Ricky that like first broke a hundred thousand in a season just a few years ago. The purses have definitely increased because now you have Gannon breaking 200, but this year you also have Ricky broke 100, Calvin broke 100, Kristen broke 100, and Missy's first season ever breaking 100. So you had a lot of other players breaking 100, but we're talking doubling that. Like, that's just not happening. I think, you know, to switch off of other another way this could happen, I see two other paths and what has been laid out. I think one other way is if we saw someone do a huge you know, million dollar added tournament. We see someone come in and just like one tournament, it goes crazy. And the winner of that wins a hundred grand or something. You know what I mean? Or instead of the purses increasing, I could see the pro tour make a decision. Hey, it's more important visually for the winners pot to not go down. So instead they redistribute the purses to make them more top heavy, which could not necessarily mean the purses grow, but someone's potential earnings could grow if they're having a Gannon like season. I don't see that happening. I do think, as Gary said, that Gannon's the one that's most likely to break this record again. But I think it stands for at least five years. But realistically, the purses are going to have to go up or something's going to have to change because six Elite Series events, two majors, the Tour Championship, a Q Series, and an A-tier all in the same season is what it took Gannon to do it. 
and a flex start. Don't forget. And a flex start. It. Um, all right, Ryan, wrap it up. It seems to be a consensus here, but what are your thoughts? All right. Uh, I'm going to say one to two years. I'm going bold. Ooh. I'm going bold. And this is why. I'm putting all my chips in and on Gannon. I think he's going to do it again. I think he has the killer mentality. I don't think he's going to crumble like Vinny. I think that there is every potential for him to pull this again. And we're going to be sitting here saying, oh, my gosh, he did it again. How in the world did he do this? His game is just so transcendable against all courses that he plays. I just don't see a reason that he's not going to do it again. I th- I like what Hunter said. I think that uh, purses are going to start getting more top heavy. I think manufacturers are going to start pulling um guaranteed money and salaries away and that's going to start going to pots instead and i think people uh manufacturers are going to start investing more in their tournaments and making their tournament bigger i think it just brings in so much more uh beneficial and promotion of their specific brand and their mold if they invest heavy into their actual tournament and you're going to see less and less money being available for these players uh, to sign contracts. I think we're going to have a lot of players go in without a contract this year coming up. And I, I think it's just manufacturers are going to get smarter with their money um, and they're going to start dumping it into purses. So I'm saying, if not next year, I'm going to say in two years. Hey, I mean, and the thing is, yeah, go ahead, Brody. Yeah, I, I don't see that happening. Um, players, players make a lot more money over the course of the year than the actual tournament does. Now, if all of a sudden these tournaments started bringing in 40,000, 50,000, 70,000 spectators, then maybe I could see that happening. But you look at any other sport, they're pl- they're paying uh, their money to their players so much more than a specific event. Now, the marketing across maybe their entire marketing plan, right, might be more. But some of these sponsorships to some of these players is outrageously large compared to what they pay for a specific event. So I, I don't see that happening. And this is also comparing events that are actually very profitable. I don't know if there's that many disc golf pro tour events out there that are super profitable. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, well, I will say this, the uh, reason I don't hate Ryan's take, at least on the, the timeline is I, I will say the one thing you could, you know, my gut reaction is similar to the rest of you where it's like, yeah, I mean, this thing could stand for five years to a decade just because of how crazy it was. But also Gannon Burr is the type of player who is just kind of robotic and, and has, has only gotten better season to season. So it's not completely unfair to say, unless somebody else from the field begins to challenge more often. I mean, he kept getting better as the season went on Gannon Burr did. It seemed like, so yeah, but the question is crazy. It's not crazy to think we could be sitting here next year thinking he just repeated it. He did it because he's only got like the craziest thing he did this year was probably sweep the plus events. I think when you look at the payouts, cause only winning um, a couple of the majors, you know, that's, that, that is what it is. There's more on the table for him there really. And when it comes to the payouts, I think the fact that he swept the plus events, that was almost the craziest thing he did this year, but he could win one more of the majors, him winning three out of four majors. Isn't crazy. And then, yeah, we could be sitting here next year being like, he did it again. I mean, what's going to change? Well, I think the, this question really boils down to, do you think purses are going to go up? in the near future or will they no, take I think time? I think they'll probably stay I, the same, I but, think that's, that's, but you have to ask yourself like is Gannon's game built off of, did he just get hot this year? Or is that just who Gannon is? And I think that's just who he is. I think he's just going to be agree. dominant again. Well, so but, he, well, it's also a question of every year we've seen the field get better too. So yeah. like, who's to say the harder next and year? Harder. No, I, yeah, exactly. I, I think yeah. it's, probably a much higher chance that that record could stand for quite some time. I mean, Hunter, you're right. Doubling it. It literally was just a few years ago. We're like, wow, people made six figures and he just doubled. That is, is yeah. ridiculous. Um, Cause this season we saw Denver. way, way like last season, there was like one dark horse winner with Parker this yeah. season. There yeah. was a lot more plus no, you, plus you had, one. plus you also had a bunch of people where you're like, Oh my God, they almost won. Yeah. Right. So like that's I mean Proctor also won for the first time this year. I mean there's Joey I, buckets. You had Ezra Robinson not win, but up there all season long. It's just, I think I think we're going to see more of that. So it's just it to Hunter's point, it's just gonna be harder to win as much as he did this it year. Be, but he, yeah. also but he definitely could. Top, he could get better. He can definitely get better. He was he was inside the top five for almost every single event. So no, like if you, no doubt. If you put yourself yeah. there, yeah, it, it it does seem unfeasible 
for it to happen again. But Amber is different. Amber, in, in, in all reality, yeah. if I took my debate night hat off, I agree. I think it's going to sit for a while. But if anyone can do it, it's Gannon Burr to, yeah. to go back to back. Yeah, it would be, uh, it'll be, he will have crazy expectations going into next year. That is, that is certainly the case. How, how does he handle the pressure at that young of an age? Yeah, that'll be unless the Eagle, Eagles crossings guys decide to put up a five hundred thousand dollar purse and get an event out there. there you I go. actually I do like that take too. I think that the best chance this record broke in the next five years <laughs> is an event with like a winner like a hundred, take all hundred thousand dollar purse. Well, the winner take all would be against <laughs> PDGA rules. So like I don't uh, know if that would be on the PDGA earnings, quote unquote. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that'd be one of those be, weird though, ones. If they put up a tournament like that, let's say a guy won a hundred grand and then like the rest of the year he only won like sixty and he just like didn't it wasn't the right I, player to I bring. Mean, we heard the rumors of like a, a yeah, Dylan Cease or something putting a million dollars into a tournament just something to see what like happens. That. Well, and here's Trust. the thing, because even if I think Rick, what Rick finished at 108 or did he, that was, was that before his championship? He, I, think I think he was yeah, at 108 think, before. I think yeah. he's at like 120 something. Yeah, now. I think he got within he almost got to 130. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Got yeah. within hundred K. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the uh, tour championship here. So, Obviously, they've been working with the Nevin venue since Hornet's Nest was under construction there for a little bit, and that's why they moved, and they just didn't move back. Next year, it's already been scheduled to come here to where we are in Lynchburg. So at least for now, we're moving away from that venue. So I kind of just want to ask in conclusion, do you think the Nevin venue was overall a success when used for the Tour Championship? If so, why? If not, what issues did you have with it? Um, so you can kind of break it down from every, every aspect you want. Definitely some entertaining uh, golf to watch played there, but curious to hear what each one of you thinks about that venue. Gary, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it was successful. I mean, there are some things I really like about Nevin. There are a lot of par fours there that give you options to either play safe or aggressive off the tee. So you kind of have a choice to play, make your harder shot, your tee shot, or whether it's going to be your up shot. And there's a lot of par threes that require a combination of both distance and accuracy. And there are some holes out there that give you great options. Like hole 15 comes to mind where you can you can play that pushing forehand up the left that kind of stables out at the end or the hyzer flip straight shot up the right. You know, at Nevin, it seems like good shot shots get you par great shots get you long birdie looks and nearly perfect shots get you birdies and i also like that nevin puts a lot of pressure on your 30 to 45 foot putting skills um you don't really get to take shots off out there and birdies are worth more there than i think at a lot of venues finally i really like its use of park style holes with one five six seventeen and eighteen because i think it shakes up the flow of the dense woods and it makes you kind of forget about the wind until you go out into those holes um i don't really have a lot of issues with Nevin as a course. If I'm being picky, it's probably the power lines on eight or like the light posts on hole 17. I mean, you can make the argument that those are easily avoidable just by throwing better shots, but Kristen did break the light on hole 17. Um, but ultimately, though, I, I think that Nevin served its purpose uh, this year and the years that we had it, and it acted as a fine spiritual successor to the Hornet's Nest. Uh, I also think, though, that the Tour t Championship is making a good choice to move somewhere where we can challenge both wooded and open courses hopefully as long as new london can be ready in time for that to happen next year so that's the big hope yeah that will be interesting to see for sure um we're actually just out there talking to the parks and rec guys today and they're they're still hoping that the timeline is like around february i think to get things moving so wow. we will see we will see um hunter what do you think about the nevin venue yeah i'm only going to judge it off of this year since this is the only year we had the current tour championship format um being the strokes stand the whole time and you know what you got to say is you take a step back no matter how you feel about it overall it's a success in the sense that the players with the biggest stroke advantage coming in walked away winners so it at least did that and it also gave us a really exciting fashion uh where there was both thrilling golf from mpo and fpo I think the two big downsides are the course itself and the location um location first off it's just 40 minutes from winthrop where the major was four days before three days before that's the biggest knock against any of the courses in the Charlotte area for this specific event. It's just too close to USDGC on the schedule to where you're just not going to get a big turn up for back-to-back -back high level events. And if you're making people choose, it has been proven over and over and over they're choosing USDGC, which means that for the event that has the biggest purse of the year, that was some of the most exciting golf we watched all year. We had one of the smallest crowds we had all year. That is one of the biggest knocks against it. The other downside to me is just the wooded nature of the course. It's a very, very tight wooded track, um, which, you know, people either love it or hate it. But for me, being the tour championship and what this event is supposed to mean and, you know, awarding someone who 
has played all season to earn this their spot in it, it can actually be the exact opposite because you see a player like Holland Handley who had a phenomenal season, just isn't good in the woods, get kind of punished. So I really think it needs to be a mix of wooded and open and Nevin just doesn't provide a big enough mix. Yeah, it's definitely a valid complaint. Um, Ryan, what do you, what did you think about the the Nevin course? Okay. Uh, if I had to choose one, I'm going to say no. Um, unfortunately, uh, Hunter and Gary did a good job summarizing us why. Um, I did, did the result occur that should have happened? Yes. The winners that I think could win, did win. Uh, Gannon came in first, Ricky came in second, Missy won, Kristen came in second, right? Like none of those are all that surprising. Uh, however, it's just such a tight course. I, I really feel like it suits up for a player's game. A couple years ago, you look back and I know it's, it's Hornets Nets, not Nevin, but like the fact that Nathan Queen won, and I know some things that have changed, and that just sits so much in the back of my mind that like, if we pinhole the tour championship to, to a style of golf and yes i understand nevin has some open shots and some park style shots as well but it is so heavily wooded it requires such uh, a finesse throw that again some of the best disc golfers they can do but it, it leaves out players like ab that that i mean did he choke it sure maybe it, it, when we go back to that whole thing but i i just i think courses like new london i know there's more courses in georgia that fit this perfectly florida i agree with hunter pulling it out and away from that charlotte area i know it's a hotbed but there's got to be other courses in in north carolina that have a better mix like new london so i'm really excited to see it come here i think it's going to provide enough enough proximity change to uh entice more people to come show up and and buy tickets for it yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, Brady, wrap it up. What did you think about Nevin? Glad to see it gone. Uh, I mean, I got to play out there once, I believe. It might have been my first year. I, I can't remember exactly, but I definitely got to play out there one time for the tour championship. Um, you know, outside of like the inflatable house, they had us like walk through. Uh, it didn't really feel special. <laughs> didn't really feel like you're at a tour championship or the feel of that. Um, the best way I could describe it is it, it kind of feels like when you're in the open holes, it kind of feels like you're at like a high school cross country meet is kind of the vibe, which is just not, I don't know. And, and again, it's, it's very difficult when you don't have these like disc golf uh, specific courses that are specifically just disc golf. There's not like other things around them. Um, once you get into the woods, you know, I think it, it kind of helps a little bit, but problem with that is once you get into the woods, it's terrible for the spectators, very difficult. Um, so the people on the ground aren't really probably having the most enjoyable experience as they would at another course. Um, the other thing that kind of is, is lacking an, an issue, if you will, is like, it doesn't really have like an identity. Like the course itself is very fun to play. I, I enjoyed playing it. There are some very enjoyable holes, but like the, I, there is no, you don't feel anything when you show up there. And it's very similar to, uh, you remember like DDO when they tried to make, mix in those like park courses. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And those were just kind of like, what are we doing over here? It, it kind of is like that. It's like almost just, there's not really a, a, a vibe if you will. Yeah. Yeah. I've always said, I mean, the two, the toughest thing, which everybody kind of mentioned, it's, it's weird to throw certain players into the woods. And I think the biggest thing is like, okay, so 80% of the tour events don't happen in thick woods like that. I mean, really like 90 or 95% in that thick of woods. And then you're going to put the tour championship in there to like, try and reflect the golf that was played over the course of the season. I, I think agree. that's weird. Um, and then, yeah, I think, we talk about making an, an event that's already struggling with an identity to make a, a memorable event. A course has to have some kind of, I don't know. It has to kind of grab you in. And I think a wooded courses already have a very tough time being memorable as far as the holes, like literally just remembering hole to hole, because they're going to look so similar. If you don't, work to give them signature features or really unique shaped fairways it kind of can blend together i say so i think there's already a challenge there um i think courses like northwood do a better job with that and um so yeah i think that 
it's probably good to move away even without those reasons. Like the other one you mentioned is the proximity. I think is just a huge problem. So um, yeah, I think this is still an event that should just be spectated way more. Hopefully next year it does a little better because there's a lot of great access to the pros. I was saying earlier that, you know, the, like the final, like hole 17, you could have been right next to Gannon Burr. There was like no gallery in the way basically. And like, that's just crazy. Um, the other, the other thing is to add on, like this could be an event, just try to like try that Eagles crossing, like make it a, not a really big spectator in in-house spectator. I mean, you're already not having a lot of people show up to Nevin. Uh, just make it a big event that people watch and, and have yeah. it, have it be at Eagles crossing where it is this big magical place, you know, that hey, everyone talks about. Then you're right in the Ooh, middle of the country. Know. So Ricky doesn't have to drive, uh, there you go. 22 hours. hours or whatever it was all in yeah. Arizona. I'm, I, I mean, do you think that was just 22 hours of reflecting on, I had a six stroke lead. How did I just do that? If, I, if I'm I should have been the next question. If you're Ricky, how many stops are you taking on the way home? I got a feeling Rick's taking minimum like one. Oh yeah. Minimum. He, he posted it like 1am and it was like 10 hours left and he's like time for the night shift. I'm like, making, I don't think that. Dude, I think he's just stopping the pee. If I'm Rick, I'm making oh, a week yeah. out of that. I'm seeing how many courses I can play along the way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, got nothing. It's the off season. I'm, I'm taking two weeks getting home. Yeah, that's that's a long drive. Um, all right, so we're gonna kind of talk about the season as a whole now. Um, kind of left this up to you creatively. So, if you were to write a book about the 2024 season, you're the author. What would you title it? I want to hear your titles. And then also, what do you just feel were the main storylines of this year, the kind of chapters in the book, um, if you will? Hunter, I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Here. I'm very You're already excited. smiling. Yeah, I just, I'm happy for the title here. I would title my book, The Sun Rises on the Ice Age. Because ah. this, this season felt like Gannon, obviously, coming into the season, we already knew he was a good player. Okay, but his performance out there all season long it felt like we have fully entered a new era of dominance. Not only that, but even the players that were challenging him, as you just like kind of think through, it was not the typical Ricky, Paul, Calvin. They all had their moments, but that wasn't week in and week out, which I know it's been a, a transition period out of that for a little bit, but this felt like the stamp of, oh no, it's over. The new era's here. Um, you had Anthony Barella sneaking in the mix, uh, breaking out, getting you know multiple wins. Paul went winless. You had Isaac winning worlds yet again. Joey Bucket sneaking in there. Ezra Robinson having a sneaky good season all, all year. It just felt like this was the first season where it's like the new era is officially here and the Ice Age has begun. This is now Gannon Burr's era, right? You had the Paul era. You transitioned into the Ricky era. You had this era of the COVID era, and now we're in Gannon's era. It's really what it felt like. And don't hear me wrong. Ricky and Paul are still around. They still have plenty of time left in them and all that. But this is the first season where I just felt like their era of the sport, their era of dominance is done. It just it didn't feel like week in, week out, I'm picking them in my top three because I'm going to be stupid not to. I don't know how many times I, I put – I don't think I put Paul in my top three, but maybe once or twice at the beginning of the year, and I didn't do it again. And Ricky was just kind of sprinkled in. So the sun rises on the ice age. That's I, have, my book. I, I will have to ask if the sun is rising on the ice age, does that mean that it's melting? Mm -mm. Yes. No. Okay. Oh, the sun doesn't rise in Antarctica? Not often, but valid point. Um, okay, Ryan, what's your book? All right. First off, props. I love this question. I, it makes me so happy. All right. Throwing all the way back to chess.com invitational. We're naming the book Two Queens and a King. Ooh. All right. So I loved the increase in FPO. I just, I found myself more drawn to FPO this year. It is something that we've been talking about is when is FPO going to feel uh, more of their own? And I felt like with Kristen, still dominating, don't get me wrong, but the infusion of Evelina. And we've got Missy and then Own, and then we've got these young guns like Ellie, Ezra, and uh, Annika, and just all these other girls starting to finally come into the FPO. It finally feels like it's it's getting ready to take that next step. And now we, we walk out of the 2024 season with Evelina. We walk out with Kristen, two non-US based disc golfers to now spread disc golf in Europe even more. I, I'm just so excited about FPO. And then obviously the King. We've got Gannon Bird just going absolutely uh, ham on the season. I it's just it's it's unbelievable. I don't call myself a Gannon fan at heart, but man, it is hard not to root for the kid. 
He is so young. He is so poised. Uh, I, I'm so excited for where disc golf is going. Um, I just thought that it was fitting to, to throw it all the way back to chess.com, a new, a new, uh, tour stop. I like it. That's a good title. Also good shout out too. Cause yeah, I do think FPO had some exciting things going on this year and some refreshing, uh, some more refreshing play. Yes. Yes. So fair enough. Um, Brody, what say you? I'm going to start with the storylines first and then I'll do okay. the title at the end. I so like that. major storylines, I think AB winning four times, that's got to be up there. A guy that has been struggling, uh, was in one of the biggest moments at the European open. That was a choke job and, uh, was able to figure it out this season. Isaac Robinson going back to back at worlds. Uh, I don't know what it is with that tournament. Obviously he's very good, but something about that tournament, he just, the bright lights, he plays so well. It'll be interesting to see if he, uh, three peats, uh, Paul Macbeth, not winning. That's obviously a big one as well. Uh, Ricky coming up short again in the majors, fourth, third, second, and sixth this season. That's going to be another storyline that continues on. Missy winning the big money tournaments. She just likes money. Uh, Joey Buckets becoming a consistent threat. That was cool to see. Presno shocks everyone and just wins a major at Champions Cup. Yeah. Chris Dittar hitting a thousand rated, also doing a disc. Shout out. Uh, baskets suck at catching discs. The Jedi spotter. Evelina can be the worst putter in the field and st still win a world title. Diver gate and pros <laughs> not being able to show up to their tea time. I don't know if you remember at the beginning yeah. of the season, wow. no one knew how to look wow. at a watch and everyone was pissed about it. And with that, my title is mastering the brick. The two, the true story, how a Lego kid dominated the sport of disc golf. <laughs> that's great. You had, you had all the storylines. That's honestly, that's impressive. That the, uh, the Brody break. doesn't watch disc golf. Haters are on blast right now. That no, was, no one says that. Stop it. They say they, I don't watch FPO. Oh, sorry. Yeah. They well, say that about us, Trev. Well, I, really, I figured I had never heard any of those storylines. That's crazy. That yeah, happened. That news to me. Do you think Brody question? Do you think, um, do you think Isaac at that tournament, maybe it's cause he focuses more. Oh, was, he definitely gonna... focuses way more <laughs> he ups the focus. No, he cares about it more. And so he practices more. Does not focus more? Come on. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, Gary, let's see you follow that one up. What's, what does your book look like? I like this. This is fun. <laughs> oh, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. Pause, pause. Oh, it's a silent. It's a silent movie. Oh, it's a silent movie. movie. Black and white. No, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. No. Somebody's going to have the mouth for Gary. Ro or Siles, what's going on? Siles is freaking out. He just threw it's something Gary across. It's Gary Gate. Gary Gate. Hunter and Brody are, and I are scared of him. We, I, feel, we don't I think again. this is a bit. I think he was setting this up. This is a bit. He's Why is his timer it. not running? Why is his timer not going? Come he's on, gonna, man. He's going to spin it. I, I'm a, yeah. Uh, oh, the gonna, mic's uh, off he, to the side, and we still can't hear him. Oh, man. Man. This guy huh? beat us 10 times this season, guys. Guy doesn't even have a mic and he was winning. He's a mic and he's winning. Mastering the brick. I had no idea what was coming after mastering the brick. Brody, that was good. Thank you. You had a lot of storylines in there. I even forgot about. He's back. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. I don't no know how to All right. Um, book. Go. All right. So let me introduce you to, to the new bestseller in the disc golf community. Ooh. The book is going to be titled the, the fall and rise of the disc golf empire. There are four mm. distinct acts here. Act one is titled the reckoning. This tells the story of Anthony Barella saying that enough is enough as he takes 2024 by the horns and shows everyone that they're going to have to go through him if they want to win. Act two is the prophecy. This is where oh. in May, the one true final boss rises. Gannon takes the baton from AB and tells him to rest as he puts the tour on his shoulders and begins to run away. Act three, the whispers. Contracts are being canceled. Layoffs are coming everywhere. Companies are struggling. This is the tale about how the erosion under the surface begins, sowing seeds of doubt in the community about the longevity of the sport, leading to our final act, a new era. Paul Macbeth doesn't get a win this year. Ricky is chased down and dethroned at Nevin. The old guard is struggling. The new guard is here. Can anyone stop Gannon Burr? 
This book is going to cover incredible storylines like Anthony Barella's great start to the season, the historic performance of Gannon Burr, the Presnell surprise, the back-to-back <laughs> world titles for the for Isaac Robinson, the growth of parity in the FPO field, the troublesome news we keep getting about layoffs and money issues in the, in the disc golf community, the failure of Ricky to pick up a major, and Paul to even win an event. There will be ups, there will be downs, tales of love, loss, wow. and excitement. I'm predicting wow. a bestseller and a must-read for everyone in the sport. What title? What what tale of love? Team Lucky. <laughs> That's awesome. I wanted Gary to say it. <laughs> that was great. That was great. That was that incredible. Was cool. that was I want to really read it. Time. When's it available? <laughs> Um, wow, I gotta write down this book On question. We gotta do this January. next year. That's that's that just got the best I like the axe. You should have us name axe next year, Trevor. That was great. Yeah, what? Okay. Oh, man, that was phenomenal. I didn't get the that memo. Was, Clearly a theater crazy. kid. <laughs> they played out. Did, did you do theater, Gary? Uh, I did everything in high school. Theater, yeah. sports, all of it. The answer is yes. Trevor. The answer was yes. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. no shame. That was great. I was um, in my sixth grade play, but I was just a backup dancer. Is it light theater? <laughs> I think I was a tree or something. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds about right. A big um, wow. Okay, that was great. That was great. I feel like I needed like I needed that because I feel like everything that happened this year just went right back to me. You know, it's just in time and since I don't watch piece. anything, it was good to you know hear about it for the first time. <laughs> Um, <laughs> anyways, okay. On our last topic for our final topic here, um, kind of getting our last little brush up on what we thought of the players. I want to know who is a player that who overperformed the most underperformed the most and one who did exactly what you expected this season, right on brand. Um, this could be MPO or FPO players, obviously you kind of, you know, choose the player that fits the bill for you, Ryan, go All for right. it. Here we go. Overperformed Joey Buckets. Uh, going into this year, I did not know much about Joey Buckets. I'll be honest. Uh, I think I've heard of his name coming up, and he just crashed on the scene. Starting in Chess.com, uh, he played really well. He was constantly top ten. Heard of his name in and out of the, of the uh, one and only uh, Foundation top ten, the list that everybody cares about the most. All right, uh, and his his name was flowing in and out of that. I did not expect joseph anderson to come in and do anything that he did kudos to him uh i i that's awesome another young gun adding to uh the the future um i've got underperforming i'm going eagle mcmahon uh for as much potential as he is with a move to mvp with another uh time or another year of, of getting his body back in uh, eating meat, I was expecting so much more. Uh, I just, it, it didn't happen. Um, person that was on brand is Missy Gannon. Big money, Missy. She she did what she always does. She wins a big tournament. She she cashed out a ton of money. She hit six figures for the first time. Kudos to her. Uh, she's really backing up what, what her name is. I do want to throw one person in there as well, and that's James Proctor. Uh, being a teacher, I really want to put him in over performance. Uh, he was special ed. I'm a teacher as well. It was really good to see James Proctor in there. Um, I, I think he did really well this, uh, this year um, as well. Yeah. Good picks. I bonus point for eating meat. That is hilarious. That's such a funny call call back. I forgot that he just gave up no longer a vegan. That's, That's that is, that is very underperforming for him as a vegan. Um, Brody, who are, who are your players? Yeah, big shout out to James Proctor too. I remember we we were talking about him a couple of years ago because I played that Las Vegas tournament, Halloween yeah, Classic, he and he was out there. And I was like, "Why is this guy not touring? This guy is disgusting." So good to see him get a win. All right, over performance. I think easy one. Andrew Presnell. Uh, he won a major. His best finishes last year was fifth at Jonesboro and seventh at the Preserve. His best major finish in the last few years was 24th at 2021 USDGC. Just literally a guy that is super solid, but doesn't really win big tournaments or gets really close to winning big tournaments, just decides to win a major. Pretty, pretty impressive stuff. A uh, little pushback rebuttal, quick rebuttal with Joey. Everyone on tour knew he was good. And was going to be good. That just kind of shows you like the coverage. We don't really get to have the coverage and we don't really get to tell the stories outside of like the lead cards. A lot of times everyone knew that kid was going to be really, really good. Uh, that played with him last year under performance. I think Paige Pierce, um, I got to put her on here. One win at Portland open. She played 17 events this season, 
uh, won two of twice in the eight events she played before getting injured in 2023, won two majors in three events in 2022. So we're starting to kind of see a, a little bit of a slope down uh, underperformance. I thought we we're going to see a little bit more of a bounce back after the injury. Um, and most expected, Matty O. Dude had one of the best highlights getting the ace on hole 14. Still have no idea how Thomas Gilbert's uh, Instagram video was better than any camera that we had out there, but I guess iPhones are just superior. Uh, the dude goes on no wins this year, but super steady. That's his name. Six top tens, 12 top 25. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong. I think Joey buckets did win rookie of the year last year. Did he not? You're saying Anybody? last year, last year. Did he, didn't he win rookie of the year? Mm. I don't. I thought it's so hard. It's so hard. hard. This man, yeah. Wait, which rookie um, of the year? Pro tour? Yeah, or yeah, yeah. It kind of shows you that those don't really matter. At the time, rookie of the year is handed out. I'll give credit to Ryan. You usually are like who? So that that is fair. Um, but I, I, that might have been his only act. Was it Robert Burridge? Burridge did Burridge Burridge one, one, one years ago. Point. Was that two years ago? It was a few years ago, and we did know about Burridge. Um, college, from like college, yeah. But yeah, I'm not sure. I feel like he may have. Anybody got that? I can't find anything on it, no, but okay. that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Oh, yeah, like, we actually look it up to see if we can find awards. Yeah, yeah, good, that doesn't good mean luck. that. You've got to find an article happen. about a new sponsorship with Barbasol, and you'll probably see it at like, the bottom and fine print. Yeah, good um, luck. But I'm not salty. All right, Gary, who are your players? We're going to keep this unique. Uh, so I'm going to start with who did exactly as expected. Every single year, this guy is always there playing solid disc golf. He gets his name in the conversation at a handful of events. He picks and chooses where he plays at, and he's the four-time-in-a-row winner of the Lake Eureka preview event. Here's your chance to guess. <laughs> Chris Dickerson. Um, I think he's the epitome of consistency. He seems to just survive the ebbs and flows of the sport. And he did all of that despite fighting some serious health issues. So he, he's the guy who I expect every year. He does what we expect. Um, as for the overperformer, I think even though things like average finish aren't that much greater for him going from 19th to 14th, this guy played five more events this year, specifically five more events within the United States. And he moved from 26th on tour to third on tour this year, nearly doubling his tour points. That's Nicholas on um, he looked so much better at events and he managed to keep pace. Um, he took down two wins at the open at Austin and Turku. And here's his major finishes second at champs cup, sixth, at the European open second at worlds and seventh at USDGC. This guy was on a tear this year. Also honorable mention going to Rebecca Cox for going from 29th to 11th and nearly doubling her tour points for the underperformance. Um, we're sport for choice this year. Uh, I'm going to choose the one that's the most personal to me because uh, there are guys who fell much bigger in heights. But if you look at the potential that was there last year, if you look at the amount that everyone around him improved, Alden Harris was the biggest underperformer for me. <laughs> so, I think God he honor. has all the talent and, and, in an ever-growing game, but unfortunately the best thing about him this year were the vlogs that he put out. Wow. Tough line. Um just got the update from Silas. Uh, Paul Kranz and Luke Taylor, Luke Taylor. were your two yeah, Paul Luke Taylor. Kranz. And, yeah, Dirty and Paul Kranz was supposed to be years. something this year. Everyone was hyping up MVP for that pickup. Yeah. So there you go, Hunter. Maybe you can yeah. take Paul Kranz for your, uh, <laughs> your final pick there. Go <laughs> no, ahead. No, I was almost, I almost had all three saved for me. This is going to be great. Crazy. But yeah, I was in, I was licking my chops, but I'll find an underperformer by the time I get there. <laughs> uh, exactly what I expected is where we're going to start now. Uh, cause we're not gonna start my underperformer. Exactly what I expect is Ricky Wysocki. I think he played the brand of golf. We kind of have expected. He struggled at majors. We've expected that since 2017, he picked up a few wins. He sprinkled himself into the conversation all throughout the season. I think that was a Ricky Wysocki season. That's what's to be expected. Um, underperformer. I have one. I don't think anyone said this one, but I just thought of it. I'm gonna go with Isaac Robinson mainly because last year we had the two major wins and he started picking up steam at the end. And we kind of expected him to be a guy that was in the conversation week in and week out. And he wasn't, especially to start the season, obviously he picked up the win and, you know, was able to kind of pick up steam at the end of the season, but we expected him to be very, very, very consistent. And we honestly, Ezra Robinson was almost more consistent than him throughout the season. If you take away Isaac's world's win, Ezra would have beat him in pro tour standing points without taking a win. And I, I didn't expect Ezra Robinson to be the better brother. So I'm going to go underperformer as Isaac Robinson. And then overperform, overperformer, there was a lot of great options. A lot of people exceeded their expectations. We had Anthony Barella, for example, four wins. Who expected that? Not me. Ezra Robinson, I just shouted out. But let's be honest with ourselves. Okay, there's only one answer here. 
nine wins with two majors and 200,000 freaking dollars in his bank account. No one expected that. Sure, we expected this guy to be good. Six wins, I wouldn't have believed you. But nine with two majors? Gannon Burr outperformed everyone's expectations of what's possible. And moving mountains, doing the impossible, is the overperformer of the year. Gotta be Gannon Burr. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, I hope people downvote you for yelling. Yeah, you know, some people <laughs> like it loud, some people don't. I don't know. Well, it's just really easy. When you Brody yell, it's already, actually not that bad. Brody is already in the comments of the. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think people just don't realize my normal voice. Kelsey always tells me, she's, are you yelling right yelling. now? I'm like, no, I'm talking. She's like, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, can I just throw out the person that could beat Gannon Burr next year? Okay, let's say the I'm combo. <laughs> the combo of an Isaac Robinson world's late season mixed with an early season Luke Humphreys. <laughs> <laughs> Dirty Luke Humphreys. Right, it's a great point. Luke Humphreys won the best players ever in the first three events every yeah. year. True. You get that guy Watch out for that guy. Waco, Austin, Waco, 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 is crazy. Yeah, he's gonna yeah be... but Gannon was the one who beat him in two of those events. That's true. That is <laughs> okay, point. Gary, no one cares. <laughs> who cares? Good point. Um, good point. <laughs> yeah, good picks, good picks. Um, so here's the thing. Normally our finals is only two people, but we're doing all four tonight. Because oh, the finals gosh. question is kind of a special homage to the debate night season. And I want to hear what everybody has to say. And um, points are pretty close. So realistically, whoever has the best answer, I'm probably just going to give the win. So I'll, I'll keep I'll keep the point lead in mind. But for our final topic of our final episode of the season for debate night, I want to know. I think I did this last year as well. What was your favorite moment of the 2024 debate night season? It's that simple. Um, we will let Gary and Hunter, you guys have the most points. So I will let uh, Gary has the most wins. So Gary, I'll let you go first, followed by Hunter, then Ryan, then Brody. Sounds All right, good. Gary, what was your favorite moment of the season? Don't worry about uh, time, really. It's more so uh, I'll keep the timer on just for your own perspective. But speak from your heart, Gary. Okay? Speak from the heart. Yeah, go. Yeah. Well, I mean, first and foremost, and, and this isn't this isn't a pandering thing, like for points or whatever, but a huge uh, thank you is due to Foundation for the opportunity to be part of something like this because. I mean, they put out that video looking for, you know, auditions, and I took a random shot at that, and, and I'm sitting here doing my 20th show, and um, I got to meet the foundation team this year. I got a chance to caddy for Brody for a round of Ledgestone. So just sincerely for me to you guys, thank you for being you know, given the opportunity to do do this. And, um, you know, I think there were some big highlight moments this year that I really enjoyed. Uh, on May 1st, we had the Mount Rushmore video. And I don't think I've ever had so much fun preparing for a video. I had no intention of getting any points in that Mount Rushmore question. <laughs> and uh, just the laughs that we had on that video were, were great. And then a couple of weeks later, we found out that this isn't even Hunter's final form. Um, so going into the finals, he transformed into me, Hunter, and I didn't stand a chance. That, and that was <laughs> so much fun. Um, another big highlight was getting to engage with all the panelists uh, in the Debate Night Discord and discuss uh, different news things that are coming up together, different rounds, thoughts, opinions. But all of that being said, the greatest single part of this was the engagement with the audience. You know, getting to read the replies and comments every week was a lot of fun. Um, getting to hear some of the interesting questions that people prompted, and more than anything, getting to meet fans of the show outside in the real world. Um, I met fans in four different states who watched the show. I met pros who watched the show. Um, so a huge thank you to, to you guys out there because this wouldn't be possible without all of you. And uh, to end it off, I just wanted to share the, the four most popular questions people have asked me when they meet me about the show, and that's what platform do you guys record on? How on earth does Trevor assign points? Do you wear blue, <laughs> blue contacts? And my favorite question of all, is Brody mean in real life? <laughs> yeah. Good all good oh, questions. Oh, man. Um, now we have a handbook that we give people – um before they meet brody so it's brody 101 <laughs> um we actually know it's funny we had a uh we had a, hired an intern recently to do some social media stuff and she was going to meet brody and she was like asking about like how brody was and hunter and i like we're like trying to explain like how brody is when you first meet him because like I mean, Brody's a nice guy. Don't get like, yeah, absolutely. But he can be misunderstood by people because he's very blunt. He's loud. He's just loud. Definitely depends on the setting. Definitely Lucas depends first on the words setting. Ever, ever where Brody left our house, not his first words ever, but the first words he ever spoke about Brody <laughs> is Brody left the house to go like back to stay at my parents or wherever he was sleeping at that point. And Luca looked at me and goes, 
uncle i was like uncle's gone he goes uncle loud i was like yeah <laughs> <laughs> he's loud he's loud the, oh man the okay thing for me was after the round that we had at ledgestone together brody you stood around talking to fans for like 45 minutes so many other pros weren't doing that yeah bro tell that to tell that to Paige pierce man oh, I mean, oh, that's that dude at uh top golf that oh. <laughs> brody brushed off man <laughs> <laughs> oh, can I talk man. about that real? Can I talk about that real quick? <laughs> sure. Just real fast. I'm not someone that wants to seek special attention or anything like that. And so, if if I'm out and about, and especially out and about with my friends and stuff, I'm just I'm I'm again. At the end of the day, Gary hung out with me a lot that round. I am literally a normal person, and so when someone comes up to try to like treat me like I'm not a normal person, a lot of times to me, it's just like, uh, I'm good. And that's all that was. I was really just there. I don't even know who I was there with, but we were just playing top golf. So uh, if you just come up and treat me like a normal person, we can have a nice conversation. A lot of people do that. And it's awesome. It's true. Um, Gary, that was definitely me. Hunter was definitely one of the all times for sure. And the Mount Rushmore was great. Some good callbacks. Hunter, what was your favorite moment of the season? I didn't, it didn't take me two seconds to come up with this. And I was terrified Gary was going to take it um, okay. by far. This is the greatest debate night mo- moment I think ever. Uh, I had to go back and look at what episode it was. It was March 6th. Oh, it gosh. Was Rich's first appearance. Oh, gosh. Oh. Yeah. Oh. The dude changed the background to be the population density map in the middle of his yes. argument. And then made himself disappear game. and be like, let me show you why we don't have tournaments in the middle of the country. And then he disappeared. He goes, there's no people here. We go where the people are. <laughs> Legendary. I mean, no one even thought that was possible. And out of nowhere, he's got a heat map behind him. Uh, that really made us all up our game. So that was definitely, that was by far the highlight. Um, I was trying to think there's one other one. Oh, my other personal highlight was when I got to enter the finals as Brody and beat Dustin for him. Uh, a few weeks that ago, great. that was a great time. I, yeah, I really yeah. enjoyed that. Yeah, Champion. Rich break the game with uh, the green screen. And what was even funnier was a few weeks later when he did the animated green screen where he had like the throw from, I think it was like Holland Hanley's throw or something, or I forget what it was. Um, yeah, that was a great time. I forgot about he that. He put up an Excel sheet as well with numbers. He's he did quite he a, did few a bunch of stuff. But that was, when yeah. he did that first, that was the first one, and all of us just lost our mind because we all just yeah. realized. I gave him a like two minute standing ovation because we I, realized it was he, over. He did the Anakin Skywalker eyes for his eyes too. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, legend. Uh, okay, Ryan, what was your favorite moment of the season? Um, all right, just just a second, Gary. I'm not going to go because Gary said everything I need to say. But just thank you for the opportunity. I was um, same way. I'm an elementary school PE teacher. Never thought I'd have an opportunity to join you guys here on debate night. When I found out I got a chance, I was, man, I was so giddy. I texted all my buddies and just being able to like blast out that link and be like, guys, I did. I made it. Like it was, it was really cool. And just like, it, it was cool to have my little Maryland. Cause you know, Maryland's not big on the map. Everybody kind of skips over us. Um, just get that little Maryland representation. It, I, I was proud to have that. Um, my fa- my favorite part was actually a personal one uh, that y'all didn't see at all. But after my very first debate night, so I watched the first four debate nights leading up prior to being on uh, my very first one. And I saw all those antics happening. And I'm like, what did I get myself into? Like, I don't. I don't know how to do any of that. Like, so I was like, overanalyze. I'm going to hit the numbers. PE teacher here. So, you know, I'm doing my best. And I remember looking at my watch when you guys said go, and my heart rate was 150 and shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sitting just, my heart is pounding. And finally, I was like, wait, I teach in front of a bunch of tiny humans all day. I got this. But man, it looked like I, I had ran a marathon after the first debate night. I was so nervous. I was so excited. So many emotions. I looked down. And I'm like, holy cow. Like, I, I just got a workout during debate night. So I appreciate y'all. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Yeah. It, it, it was a grand old time. I hope to be back. Absolutely. Well, we loved having you. Um, Brody, wrap it up for us. Wrap up the season. Favorite moment. Yeah, you know, man of the people. There's a lot of them, obviously. Uh, I love reading the comments every week. Top comments, seeing what you guys say. I think there was one time, too, where I basically said the question was terrible and it was fan submitted. I think that was like the first (laughs) fan submitted question. So I apologize if that hurt you, Trevor, (laughs) the next week getting more fans to submit. 
Um, but no, this, this season, you know, we tried to do a podcast where people would call in to debate me, right? That's what this initially was with me and Hunter. Hunter was going to be the moderator. No one was calling him. No one. <laughs> Everyone no wants way. to say all this stuff on Twitter and Instagram. No one called like our most common calling was, I agree with everything you guys say. <laughs> so we had to pivot yeah. and turn the show into something else. Trevor, this is now his baby and he's taken it to heights. That I didn't think would possible. And you have done a fantastic job. Is that uh, kind of a pat on the back to Trevor? Fantastic job of getting more people in, and also a fantastic job to all the contestants because now we actually have people that are willing to disagree with me. And <laughs> if you love sports and you grew up loving sports, there's nothing more fun than sitting on the couch with your buddies and arguing about sports, whether you're right or wrong. And that's what this show has turned into. And it's been a lot of fun. And I will say this, I didn't win a lot this year. I wanted to get, you know, some of the new people feeling comfortable and stuff. But next season, folks, next fe- season, Standing Brody is oh, coming no. back. <laughs> I, I had no Standing Brody this season. Standing Brody is coming back. I'm getting a new microphone. So that way, when I talk normal, it doesn't sound like I'm yelling. And we're getting a lot of dubs. It's going to sound like you're yelling. We're getting uh, a lot of dubs next year. Microphone. Sounds good. Stop. Sounds good. Standing Brody. Also, spoiler, Are you undefeated, Standing Brody? Yes. Also, yeah. spoiler, kind of getting the itch to play disc golf. Yeah. Let's this go, bro. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This Great. past tournament. Breaking news. This past tournament, watching Ricky and Gannon kind of go back and forth, actually Might. showing emotion, yeah. actually saying stuff, and it's not boring. That's Hunter, the kind of sport I kind of want to get into. Hunter, like as he's uh, as you're saying that, he's not even looking. He's just booking a flight to Dallas right now. Like, as he's, <laughs> maybe maybe Owens 3.0 there. or whatever it is. Um, so we'll okay. see. We'll see what great, happens. Some great, great input. Some great moments. Um, I I will say I do have a soft spot for uh, for the me hunter. That was. Yeah. That was my favorite one. I, 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 that made me laugh so hard for some reason. Like I just, every time I looked at it and just, it was just, nothing was moving and it was just the white background. That was my favorite. So I'll give Gary the win on that one. But uh, yeah, Gary dominated this year. And um, if you're looking to dominate next year, keep an eye out because like we mentioned, you know, we did a tryout process at the beginning of the year. Uh, to bring in new members to the show. And we'll do that again next year because we love having new perspectives and new personalities. So keep an eye out for that. Um, Thank you to everybody who watched this show throughout the season. We had a great audience this year and it was awesome to see people enjoy the show. Thanks um, to everybody who hopped on the show, Gary, Ryan, everybody who was on the show this year. It was awesome having you guys, um, you know, give up some time during your evenings to to join and and talk disc golf with us. We've loved having you. So a lot of fun this year. Going to be great next year i'm sure there'll be some new changes and twists but until then we will see you um at the at the start of the pro tour season in 2025 make sure to tune in next tuesday or next wednesday we'll shoot it on tuesday um for the off-season podcast and um that's a wrap oh hell